let's talk about booting up a computer. First of all, this whole phrase, boot up, you may have heard this many different times. What it actually comes from, and I think we covered this in the course, is a little strap at the top of a boot that'll let you pull the boots up. What does it really mean though, in technical terms? Well, first of all, let's look at what a computer looks like while it's operating, after it's all started up and everything's good to go. You have down here the hardware. That's your central processing unit, that's your memory, that's uh, the hard disk drive, it's all this stuff, this is all hardware. On top of that, you have the software. What specific software? Well, it's called an operating system. And again, this is covered on your course. This is basically every fundamental thing a computer needs to do in terms of input and output, uh, storing different data, running other software. The operating system takes care, takes care of all of that. And when you've fired up your computer and it's gone through everything that it needs to do to start it up, it's sitting there ready and waiting for instructions or for some input to occur. And then it'll do whatever it needs to do and output. You click a button and it goes down into the CPU and it says, well, they pressed H. And then it says, oh good, we'll output an H on the screen. And that H appears on the screen. So that's after it started up. How do you get this thing to start up in the first place though? Now, the reason this is actually really important to answer is that the type of software that can get run in the computer, there's two different places it can go. You have the random access memory and the read-only memory. Read-only memory is stuff that is non-volatile, meaning it can't change. RAM is volatile meaning it can change. So ROM will contain a number of really important things, not the least of which is, what do I do when I start up? How does the machine work when it starts up? You want this to always be present. You want your central processing unit to be able to know what are the exact series of instructions I do to make sure everything's set up so I'm connected to all my input output devices, and I've got all my memory all set up the right way to start executing things, and I've kicked off my operating system software, Windows, right, um, Linux, whatever it happens to be, and now I'm up and running and I'm waiting for user input. All those instructions need to be stored in read-only memory. Well, where in read-only memory? The only way this works is if the CPU, the actual little teeny microcomputer, knows the exact location in memory of the first instruction to start with. And that's as simple as it is. You apply power, that's a one instead of a zero. In other words, you plug this machine into the wall and electricity comes through and the machine turns on and here stored in a tiny little memory on the central processing unit is the address of the first instruction to be executed every single time you turn that computer on. What the number is of the address isn't important. Just know that there's a specific exact location in memory that contains the first thing to do and then every other step after that to get this machine started and ready to actually use by the user. That's how boot up or startup works. It's for every different combination of whoever made the central processing unit and you know what kind of little operating system they have down in here and you know, what kind of memory they use, there's an exact location in memory that's the first place to go to. And when you turn on the computer, the central processing unit goes to that memory location and just starts doing exactly what it's told to do, up to the point where the operating system is running and you've got a computer that you can use to start your word processing program or start your browser to connect to the internet or whatever. But until that point is reached, it's executing all these instructions that are stored into it permanently in read-only memory. Okay, now look at a concept called formatting. The format of a thing is its specific arrangement. And what formatting actually relates to is taking some sort of storage medium, i.e. Um, a disk, a flash drive, 
way back in the day, of course, it would be a tape drive back in, well, a long time ago. Although again, tape drives are used to a certain extent for backup data. And what it, what it is is set up to store data. What does that mean? Well, let's just take the example of a disc. And remember, it's got these, con these concentric rings all the way around it, and you store data, ones and zeros, all the way along this thing. Well, here's the thing is until you actually prep this thing, it's just a random place that you can put data. What you need to be able to do is have your central processing unit, which has methods of input and output, know how is the data arranged on this physical disk. In other words, do I have chunks of eight little spaces and I grab each eight at a time and then grab the next eight and grab the next eight, okay, good. Or do I segment off that the first giant chunk at the outside of it is for storing data, the second is not to be used at all, even though there's available space there. How is the data arranged? And what that's called actually is also called partitioning. In other words, you can divide your memory location, your storage location, I'm sorry, into different sections and reserve each section for a different purpose. So formatting a disk means going through and actually putting data on the disk that subdivides it into different locations. And that format is known by your central processing unit so it can perform input and output on that storage medium. That's formatting. How do you do it in the real world? Well, back in the day when they had floppy disks, some of you may remember, you would get a new floppy disk, a three and a quarter inch floppy disk, sorry, three and a half inch floppy disk, and you'd actually have to put it in the drive. There's your drive, a little button to eject it. And you shove it in, and you'd actually have to find format as an option in your computer. And it would actually make a whole bunch of noise because it was processing that disk. Remember, the disks look like this, right? A little notch on them. And inside, although well, you couldn't see it, it's a tiny little disk. And it would literally be going through and making all the partitions on here and setting it up so that it was ready to receive data. In other words, there's data on it that tells you how to put further data on it that can be retrieved at a later time. That's formatting. And it applies when you're talking about a floppy disk or a hard disk or a flash drive or a tape drive. It's just segmenting off the different sections of the storage medium so that we can actually use it and know how to find specific data later on. Compressing data. Now, the computer scientist who's watching this is gonna hit me in the head because my data, my explanation is gonna be so simple. Doesn't matter. All you need to know is the high level on this. If you ever get a job where you need to dive deep down into data compression, you'll be doing a lot more study, but it doesn't come up for the average software developer very much at all. However, what's the thing? What's the basic concept? Well, you have a large set of data. Let's just say it's a very large um, document. It's all text. Okay. So, you need to send this over a network connection to another computer. And you want to have the size of this thing reduced as much as possible so it doesn't take a long time to transfer over to that other computer at the other end of the network. You can compress this data. Well, how do you do that? How do you compress or make it smaller? Well, a very simplified explanation of it is this, and there's many ways to do it. But essentially, you're saying, okay, here is the source area, the source of the data, and here is the destination. And on each side, there's a utility, it's a small program, software program, that on this side, it knows how to compress or make something smaller. And on this side, utility, same software, knows how to decompress to make larger. Okay, good. So what are the ways it does it? Well, the most simple version of how it would do this 
I'm giving myself a lot of room here, is this. You look for patterns. It's all about patterns. And specifically, it's about duplicated patterns. For example, in any text document, how many times do you think the word the is used? Lots. What if you could actually make the from three characters, one, two, and three, into one character? What if there were a special character called a T underscore? Just to make something up, right? Well, what you do is you go through your document from the top down to the bottom, and you find out every single place that the word the was used. And you create a compressed file and it would tell you where every single use of the word the was. It would say at place number one, place number 47, if you're counting all your letters one at a time, place number 275, and 4096, all the way through would say, when you hit this point, the word the appears. So instead of putting the, you could actually put 1, 47, 275, you can store these numbers, right? Now, every single time, that you now know every single time the word the is used. Well, what if it's a longer phrase, like, in whose name or an even longer one that's the name of a company now you can see that every single time you do this we find duplications of it and instead of listing out the exact thing you just simply say where in the document it does that you're on your way to do something pretty cool because what you can do is do this for all the duplicated content in the document list out where those duplications happen and then send it over to the destination and it will do the decompression It'll read through it, it's a much smaller file, and it'll know that every time it, uh, at place one, it needs to write the word the. At place uh, 47, it needs to write the word the. It reconstructs the document. And the, the cool thing about this is what gets sent over is much smaller because it just contains references to duplicated content rather than that content duplicated every single time. The references themselves take up less space than what they are actually standing in for, and so you've compressed the data. Now, you couldn't read this to save your life, the compressed data. It would make very little sense to you. You don't have to. The utility does. The utility knows its method for compressing something, and therefore, to do it backwards, its method for decompressing. Essentially, that's all you're doing. You're taking a large file, and you're finding a way to show a map of its different content that can be used at a later point to reconstruct it. That map has to be smaller or you're not doing your job as a, as, as a, a designer of the utilities to make the compression happen. That's compression. All right, we're gonna take a deep dive into the world of the internet. We're gonna cover a few different things. We're gonna cover a domain. Actually, before that, we're gonna cover resource. A domain name system. And two concepts, hierarchical and distributed. Okay, so to go back to some basics about how the internet works, remember the internet is an interconnected network. So you have a network of computers in one location and you connect it to a network of computers in another location. Good. That's the internet. Times about a billion makes the internet. So now on top of this, you put the World Wide Web. And remember, all this is is a network of linked hypertext documents. That's its basic definition. And when the, internet, and when the web started, it really was just documents. 
That's all it was, text documents. But then somebody got a little crazy and wanted to put an image on the document. And then someone got a little crazier and said, hey, I want to send video along this line. And another, another person got a little crazy and said, listen, I just want to send out a stream of data, say what the current time and temperature is in Brussels all the time. That would be called a service, providing a service. So what are all those things? They are resources. A resource is any thing that you can actually identify and find and use on the internet. It's a very broad term. The most common resource we're used to thinking of is websites. But a resource is also a video or an image or a service, a stream of data. These are all things that can be specifically named and found on this interconnected network of linked hypertext documents, but is now linked resources. It's all sorts of things, all available through the web. Good. So how do you find them? How do you name the exact thing you want to go to and make sure you're getting it? You use a thing called the domain name system. What is this? Well, one of the basic ways that the web works over the internet, the internet being the hardware, the web being the linked network of the data on it. One of the basic ways it works is every single one of these resources has to have a name. And it has to be a unique name, unlike any other resource available. And if you consider, by the way, the, the state of the internet and the web today, it's trillions and trillions of pieces of data, resources available. There's gotta be a way of exactly identifying the exact thing you're looking for. And the way that's done is with this domain name system. So first of all, what's a domain? Well, the domain is a unique name that identifies a website. Good, that's a domain, okay? Now, the way this works is this system is hierarchical and is distributed. So what does hierarchical mean? It means that when, you're dead, when you're, you've got this big giant collection of all these resources, all these sites, all these videos, all this stuff, well, they have an order of priority. There are top level names or areas of this web. These top level domains are things you're quite used to, like .com, .net, .edu and .org, you've used these all the time, right? These are the highest hierarchical level of how we're gonna divide broad sectors of available websites on the internet. Top level includes countries. But these can be states, they can be individual businesses. These are second tier. The top level domains, the top level names for categories of websites have to do with .com, .net, .edu, all these different sectors. .edu for education, .org for nonprofits, .com for commercial enterprises. .net was originally intended for those companies or organizations involved in the actual infrastructure of the internet and the web. These are people behind the scenes administrating things. Now, over time, those names sort of made themselves were made available for just commercial enterprises. We've all seen that sort of thing as we use the internet. So it's hierarchical. So you can see that the actual domains would have high level ones and then lower level ones for specific companies and then even lower level ones for divisions inside of companies and that sort of thing. Good, hierarchical. Distributed, now what does that mean? Here's America, don't laugh, it's as close as you're gonna get, okay? So let's say you're over here in Oregon, you got another dude over in Florida, some over here in New York, and each of them is trying to go to pets.com. So throughout the country, and this is true for the world, I'm just using America to make it nice and easy to illustrate, you don't wanna see me try to draw a globe, okay? But throughout America, there are specific sets of hardware. These are large servers, and they are called domain servers. And they exist at various points. There might be one down in Los Angeles, there might be one in Kansas, there might be one down in Georgia, might be one up in New York, right? And the data on these different domains, the .com, .org, .edu, and down below it, the specific 
Pets.com, um, UNLV.edu, University of Nevada at Las Vegas, by the way. Um, all that data needs to be accessible to a specific user of the web with the minimum amount of response time. So in other words, if you're in Oregon and you want to look up pets.com, you would like it if the closest geographical server to you actually knew how to get to pets.com. If the only domain server that actually knew how to route you to those web pages that made up pets.com was down in Florida, you're waiting all that time for the data to go to Florida and then come back. However, if it's down here in Los Angeles, you're waiting a lot less time due to sheer physical geography. So distributed in terms of the domain name system means that this hierarchical system of naming the domains and the websites in each domain, that information in that system is distributed all around the world. It also helps because if one of these goes down to a power failure or what a lot of people in the Midwest are wishing for, the California breaks off and drops into the ocean, then it isn't as if you can't get to pets.com. You can still go through that information request. It'll still go through, be routed through one of the other domain servers. So that's how it's distributed. So one other piece of information or term in this whole area. And it's something you guys have used all the time and may not have known the, the actual technical name of it. You call it the website. What's the website? Well, you know it as pets.com. What that actually is, is a uniform resource locator, also called a URL. And again, many of you have heard that term, maybe not known what it was. All that is, is the exact name for whatever resource you're trying to find. In this case, it might actually be specifically HTTP colon slash slash www.pets.com slash my dog videos. That's a very exact, precise name, right? The actual term used is fully qualified. A fully qualified URL. What that means is that every required piece of data to, without any ambiguity at all, precisely identify the exact resource you want to locate and navigate to is given. Sometimes you'll find instances where you don't need to give all of it. There may, you could actually type in pets.com slash my dog videos and your browser may very well know how to assume that you want to use hypertext transfer protocol and go onto the World Wide Web for it. But you don't have to type it. If you're ever asked for the fully qualified URL, then you know you need to give it every precise piece of data needed to positively identify it. This concept of fully qualified, by the way, comes up all the time during software development because there are many instances where you'll be able to give part of the precise exact name of a thing and it'll still work, but there's others where you need to specify every aspect of it. And you may be asked to provide the fully qualified name for something. That's how that comes in. So there you go. Okay, the question sometimes comes up, what's a router? Well, if you have a location in space and time, and you have different paths, the information can travel from that. Those paths are called routes. A router would basically be a traffic cop. It would say information of type A goes down this route. Information of type B goes down this route. C, this route, and so on. Or it may say we just have one type of information, but this, this specific route is really busy and clogged up, so we need to use this route. A router is this for networks and data that travels over that network. That's all the router is. And you've probably seen one before and it's a little black box with flashing lights and for all you know it's plotting the Armageddon of the world and if it, all four lights blink at the same time it'll blow up, you don't know. But inside it's really, really simple. All it is is an input 
Typically, this is a physical connection to the internet. That structure that goes all around the world, and again, you do not want me to try to write, make a globe. It goes into the box, the router, and then connected to the router could be several different devices, typically a, a PC, right? The router is a thing that can take information and send it to and receive it from these different machines. That's all it is at its core. Now, how much memory it happens to have in here, because it's basically just a computer, a little teeny computer with the sole purpose of routing data requests and the actual data. How much memory it happens to have in here, how fast its central processing unit is, that's what makes one router faster or better than another. But essentially all they are is routing data based on requests. That's a router. Okay, let's talk about modems. Now, in the course you learned that this stands for modulator and then demodulator modem. So, just a, a bit more explanation on this, because this sometimes can trip people up. Modulation is a pretty interesting concept. It basically means you have a known, stable signal of some sort. A signal just means something that goes from here to there. That's all. It's an energy. Typically, it's maybe radio waves. It might be uh, a telephone signal. You know, this is audio. You can hear it, right? It might be a string of ones and zeros. But it's known and it's stable. In other words, if it happens to be a radio wave, it's got an exact pattern, an exact frequency. How many times in a second it goes up and then down again? Good. So here's the thing. If you can generate a known stable signal and on a source point A and receipt point B, you know what the stable part is, you can add stuff on top of it. And when it gets over here, you can take away the stable part. And what you're left with is the added data. So if you had a frequency that was like this, and at an exact point on the upswing, you then made the frequency slightly dip. And the degree to which it dipped indicated, say, this magnitude. Magnitude is size, right? If the magnitude of the dip indicated um, an output of, let's say, oh, a motor. You want to see how fast the motor, motor was going. And every single second, from here to here, let's say, is a second. Right at the exact precise time, you make this thing dip relative to how fast the motor is going. Every second, you're transmitting the speed of that motor. And so what it means is, at the opposite end, if they can take out of the signal this part, leaving behind only the dip, they can then take these dips, analyze them, and say the motor is going 1,200 revolutions per minute. And then all of a second later, it's 1,201 revolutions per minute. And it's 1,205 revolutions per minute. They can get usable data out of the signal. So that's what modulation and demodulation are. Again, it's a very simplified explanation. But you're essentially taking a known stable signal, and you're sending it from one point to another. At its source, this, there's data that you need transmitted. At the receipt point, there's data you need received. If both sides know the exact character of the stable signal, everything that's added into that signal can then be determined at the receipt point. And that's what a modem does. It essentially uses, typically it was using like telephone lines, right? And you'd have a house right here, right? 
and here's your buddy with his, pre, his PC, and over the telephone lines, he's sending out a signal. And it goes over to here to your house, where you've got your PC, and it's being received. Each of you have a modem. On his side, the signal from the PC goes over these telephone lines. It'll look kind of like this. It'll be a nice frequency wave, right? And whatever data he wants on there, let's say he wants to transmit a message, like uh, meet at 9 p.m. at the pizza joint, right? He takes that, and the signal going out through this modem gets modified with all these little bits of data that mean Let's meet at the PC joint at 9 p.m. He goes out over the telephone lines and he hits your modem. Over on this side, what they remove is this known standard signal. What's left behind is data that your computer can interpret that says, oh, this actually means meet at PC joint at 9 p.m. And it appears on your computer. There you go, a modem. All right, lands, a local area network. Well, what does this mean? You know how we're looking at the internet and you've got these networks and then they can connect across some vast distance to another network? Okay. What if you had a big building and all you really wanted was a network amongst all the computers in that building so that information could very rapidly be transferred between them? For example, what if you had one machine that you had as a server, it would serve up data when requested, and on here you'd have all the important documents of the company. You'd have templates for invoices, right? You'd have templates for, um, for accounts receivable. Say, hey, please give me such money, right? You'd have all your uh, human resources records, all the stuff that many people throughout the company need, and you want instead of each computer having to store all this data, you want it all in one place and every computer can have access to it. You network or connect up all of these different computers and they all have access to that resource, that server. And they typically have access to each other. So if you, if you have employee Bob over here and employee Jane needs data on Bob's machine, she's physically connected to it via wiring and she can log on to his drive and be able to get whatever document he has to be working on that she needs to work on. There's a lot of value here. Rather than saving a document from Bob's machine onto a little flash drive, walking over to Jane's machine, putting it in, and copying it onto her machine. What a, what a pain, right? Just connect them all. So that is a local area network, as opposed to <laughs> these networks that cover a wide area, i.e. the world, right? Good, again, simplified explanation. Now, how do they connect them? Well, there's a lot of different uh, ways it can be done. The most common one is through a wiring and pro uh, what they call a protocol. Remember, a protocol is just an agreement. Uh, agreed format. That's all a protocol is, right? You have com computer A and then computer B and then computer C. And you want the ball to be connected. Okay, good, that's awesome. What are they connected with? Well, stuff called Ethernet cabling. You've probably seen this before. You've probably plugged it into your computer before. Typically it's blue, although not always at all, right? And it's got a little connector at the end that kind of looks like a telephone connector. It has four little wires towards the bottom. The wire comes out of it and it plugs into the side of your computer. Good, you've seen these before. What is Ethernet? Well, first of all, what's Ether? Ether comes from a word a long time ago, basically means the heavens or space. That's what Ether means. Ethernet, well, it's a network to network things across some space. I don't know who came up with the name. It might be an interesting little project. But this type of wiring is called Ethernet wiring. And it doesn't just define the physical medium. The physical medium itself defines how do I transfer data. Because if there's only a certain number of pins here, and the physical medium is only capable of transmitting these ones and zeros at a certain speed, 
you've now defined certain limits and requirements for transferring data between these. For example, if the wire had 100 little individual wires all inside it, this big wire that's connected them, if there were actually 100 little teeny wires all bundled up inside that, you could transfer a lot more data back and forth between the computers than if there were only four wires. Pretty straightforward. So Ethernet is both a physical description of these cables and a published description, if you care to look at it, of exactly how to format data that's going to go back and forth between the machines. That's Ethernet. Now, let's look at the internet and the way those things connect. Oh, by the way, these LANs, they're relatively easy to set up. You do the research on it after you've gone through this course, and you'll be able to set up a local area network. Even though it's a bit outside the realm of software, when you know networking and a little bit about these cables and how software works, you can make these connections. You can probably set up a local area network for yourself pretty easily with a little bit of study. Okay. Now let's look at different types of data transfer mediums or media in the internet. Now, many of these things you've heard of before, but you may not have realized that that's what they were. Things like DSL, broadband, dial-up. What are these things? And also, fiber optics. Well, just like that ethernet was a combination of the physical hardware the actual cable itself, and the protocols for transfer, that's essentially what these are. Let's start with dial-up. This is telephone wires. Using telephone wires as a way to get from PCA to PCB over the internet. So it means that you're limited to how fast data can transfer back and forth over there, how much can transfer at one time, and considering all these were ever meant to carry is voice data, they're not actually that hot for transferring data at the speed modern computers want. But some, sometimes, about two or three percent of the country, they actually use this. How does it work? Well, you've got your phone. Let's see if I can actually make a icon of a phone. Hey, you got your phone over here in, say, Akron, Ohio, and then you've got a PC, and you have a modem, a modulator, demodulator, demodulator. Connects to your modem, which connects through the telephone, out to the telephone lines, and then they go wherever you want to go, say, to PCB over at your friend's house in uh, Florida. And he has the same setup. He's got a modem. And he has a telephone. So, you want to connect to the internet. That says internet, trust me. Your PC uses your modem to connect through the telephone lines. The telephone clients connect to the domain name servers for the whole world, and you can find Pets.com. That's how dial-up would work. DSL. DSL is essentially dial-up on steroids. It still uses telephone lines, but it's capable of using a lot more of them. That's, and again, a very simplified version of them. And the data transfer rate over DSL is a lot, lot, lot higher than dial-up. Okay. Now, Broadband. Broadband is a bit more of a vague term. It doesn't specify an exact hardware medium for connecting to the internet. Some examples of broadband are cable. And cable and DSL can also be called broadband. Essentially what this means is data transfer 
simultaneously over high capacity infrastructure. Infrastructure is your physical hardware, whether it's your cable TV signal or really high power telephone signals or such, right? Data transfer simultaneously. So this means it can send more than one signal at once. Here's a request for a certain page going out. Here's a response for another web page coming out. Here's another request going out at the same time. You can see you can get a lot more done a lot more quickly over broadband. Okay, good. So most of the time what people are using nowadays is broadband, typically over cable, or it can be over satellite connection. Either way, all it is is you need a hardware methodology for transferring data. And the fact that you can actually have simultaneous data simultaneous data signals going at one time, that's what makes it broadband. Good, excellent. Now, what's fiber optics? Well, fiber optics is a whole different thing. What it is, is it is all about the hardware. Specifically, tiny, tiny, tiny little threads of glass, that can, and they're flexible. Flexible glass, I know, right? That lets data transfer back and forth on them at the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. That's really, really fast. A cable line, a cable TV line, can't even come close to that rate of data transfer. Satellites can't come close to that. They're relying on getting radio waves to go through the satellite. He's relying on radio waves to go through space, up into an orbiting um, satellite, and then over to another one, and then back down to Earth, or some such combination, it'll never come close to the speed of light. So fiber optics is physical hardware, physical um, cables that are installed in, you know, for in, in, internet infrastructure that allow massive rates of data to be gone over them. Uh, massive, massively fast. If, if you're a person that just geeks out over speed of the internet and you ever get a chance to use a fiber optic connection, it'll blow your mind. But it's expensive because here, the infrastructure already existed for TV. Cable TV got routed and we're using data, or we're adding data to go over that line instead of just TV signals. Here for satellites, that infrastructure actually was put in place for a whole different reason. Usually involving spying on things, but sometimes TV signals, and we're just adding data to it, right? Fiber optics are being created and installed solely for the purpose of the new data driven world, the internet. And so they have to literally, sometimes right alongside cable lines or phone lines, dig new trenches or add new wires up overhead that are all this fiberglass wire for fiber optics. There you go, that's fiber optics. What is asynchronous? Also called async for short. First you know what, you know what synchronous is. This means at the same time, you can picture two people dancing and they're spinning counterclockwise and they're both doing it at exactly the same time when this guy's arm is right at this point, her arm is exactly at that point, they are synchronous. They are moving at the same time. Everything's happening in coordination. That's synchronous. How does this relate to computers? It relates to data transfer. Lots of things in computers are about data transfer. Okay, good. So you have a source of data and you have a receipt point of data. Something here is outputting data. Let's say it's a computer and it's sending uh, sales figures for the month. Over here is another computer and needs to receive these sales figures. And it needs to store them somewhere on a drive. This output will be a tiny computer program that grabs one after another all these sales figures. You know, here's the dollar amount, here's the name of the person, here's the product that they bought, and sends it over a network connection to this computer. 
So there's two different ways this can happen. There's a piece of software here and a piece of software there, source and receive, that are both sent up to work together. This one's sending out the signal, this one's receiving it. A synchronous data connection and data transfer method would mean that whatever software is receiving the information on this receipt end is sitting there waiting continuously while this software outputs the signal and sends it across one little bit at a time until all of it arrives over here. They're operating at the same time. Now, here's the challenge. What if the computer over here needs to do something else while this data is being sent? It needs to respond to some user input like they clicked on a new program that they want to start, like their word processor. But the computer is busy simply running this operation of sending data. And because this thing is synchronous, if this output of data stops, this thing falls apart, doesn't have any more data, it's going, I don't know what to do. I don't have any more data. I'm not done yet. I can't save all this data to the drive. You can, your, your data transfer can completely fail. What if instead you could have this machine, this software at the end, this receiving, only receive little chunks of the data and then wait and receive another chunk and then wait and receive another chunk and then when it gets all of them, only then save them to the drive. That means that on the output end where you're sending, you could actually send only a chunk and then go over here and start this program, do what you're doing, and then send another chunk and so on. What asynchronous means is that data can be transmitted intermittently rather than in a continuous stream of data. And it's really valuable because it allows, as a, a, it allows the computer under your guidance, because you're a software developer, you'll be telling it what to do. It allows the computer to make really intelligent decisions about when to send data and when to do other things that are higher priority. That's essentially what asynchronous is, operating not in sync or at the same time, as opposed to synchronous, operating at the same time, as regards data transfer. There are a few other instances, or sorry, um, places in computers that this term will come up, but the primary one is in data transfer and whether the sender is in sync with the receiver or whether they can operate independently, independently, independently of each other. Let's talk about an array, what an array is. An array is an organized set of data. Simplest way to think of this to begin with is actually letters. A lot of people start with numbers and it can make a certain aspect of this confusing, let's start with letters. Let's say you have a series of little buckets. That you've organized on a floor in this way. You have a row and another row. And you have a column, another column, another column. You're standing above looking at these things. Into this bucket, you put the letter C right here. This little bucket has the letter C. This has the letter A, this has the letter T. This bucket has the letter D and then O. Wait for it. Man, you're good. Okay, why is this valuable? Well, very often when storing data, you have to store it one piece at a time. And you don't necessarily want to define the connection of one piece of data to the next or have to grab all the pieces of data in order to grab one. You want to be able to specify the exact piece of data and what to do with it. Let's say, for example, you had a problem where we wanted these words not to be all caps. You want the first letter to be caps and the rest to be lowercase. You need a way of specifying in this organized set of data what piece of data is which and have no ambiguity about it whatsoever. The typical way this is done, and there are exceptions, bear with me, but the typical way this, done, this is done is by organizing them by rows and by columns and having them start at zero. 
Row zero, row one. Column zero, column one, column two. You can now specify the location of any piece of data in here by giving the row and the column of it. One, comma two. That's row one, column two. Row one, column two, that's the G. Zero, comma zero. Row zero, column zero is the C. You can write a software program to go in and change zero comma one, that's the A, row zero column one, and zero comma two, and one comma one, and one comma two, to lowercase, A, T, O, G. And your program would be able to explicitly, with absolutely no confusion whatsoever, specify the exact location in this array, this organized set of data that you were talking about. What piece of data are you talking about? Now, often, the data that's being stored is numbers. And this is where you need to be quite careful about what you're doing. One, two, three is stored here. Zero, four, five is stored here. It can get confusing because row zero, column one, is equal to two. You get really confused about the numbers you're looking at. What's equal to what? What's the value? This is the value in row zero, column one. Now, what makes it even more challenging, every once in a while you'll find there's a computer language that decides, I'm going to do something a very little bit different. And I'm actually going to start at 1. And when you're very used to doing it the standard way, where everything starts at 0, this can destroy you. You can be specifying the exact points of data to change, and the wrong one gets changed. So it's just something to be on the lookout for during your entire developer career, that if you're ever working with an array, and something isn't working right, you're getting inconsistent data or results, check this. Does the system that you happen to be using have as a convention starting with row zero, column zero, or starting with one and one? That's it. What is the cloud? And what is cloud computing? It's actually really, really simple. It's basically, are the computers that I use here or somewhere else, and I don't know, and I don't care. If they're here, that means, let's say you have a business called Acme Automotive, and you have computers there, and you're using them to do stuff locally. Or you, as Acme Automotive, say, you know what? I don't want to pay for all the computers and the people to maintain them. I'm actually just going to use the internet to connect to a computer owned by someone else. Let's call them Easy Cloud Inc. And they happen to own a computer somewhere. Who knows where it is? Who cares? With the internet, you can connect to it. And you use this computer, this located who knows where, to do all of your work. That's the cloud. That's all it is. Now, there's fancy terms on it. If you have your computers you're using, and they're, you know, if you've got them where you are, they call that on-premises, because they're on your premises. Okay, good, awesome. And they call this off-site, they call this in the cloud, and they call it off-premises. All it is, is that you're letting Someone else is letting you use their computers. And these companies, they do this for a living. It's all they do, these cloud computing companies. So what is cloud computing? It's any computing task, anything you can have your computers do, that you could do locally. Instead, you use externally located computers to do it. Why would people want to do that? Well, for one, 
buying these computers is incredibly expensive. Two, you may only be really, really busy for eight of the hours of the day, and the rest of that time, your computers aren't doing anything. It's overnight, they're sitting quiet and cold. Well, these guys over here that have these cloud computers, they can have them do your work for eight hours a day, but then another eight hours of the day, they're doing work over in Europe, and the other eight hours of the day is doing work for companies over in Asia, and nobody suffers any performance degradation because they don't overlap tremendously. So that means that maintaining these computers and paying for electricity on them and all that sort of stuff, they're spreading the cost of that over three different geographical areas and many, many different companies. So what does that mean to you? It costs less dollars to get your computing done, your computer work. Now, obviously, things like typing and interacting with the computer, those aren't done in the cloud. It's the things like storing things in memory. It's all the things that the central processing unit does in doing complex computations, adding, dividing, subtracting, all those things. You'd still sit here as a person in your office and you'd have your computer and on your computer would be your word processor and you'd be typing things in. But what happened is that data would go via the internet and get stored somewhere in the cloud. And when you needed to look at it again, you turn on your computer, turn on your word processor, it would go and get that data from the cloud and put it here. Which means, by the way, that this little teeny computer you're using doesn't have to have very much memory at all. Because it's not gonna store a whole bunch of stuff. It's all stored in the cloud. That's cloud computing. And there's a whole lot more to it. And as a software developer, you're gonna find that many of the tasks that you learn how to do during your time at the school, you can actually do those on computers in the cloud rather than the computer that you have right at your desk, which is sometimes a great advantage, sometimes not. And you'll learn the differences between the two and when to use them. But that's the basics of what cloud computing is. Different data formats. You may have seen different files that you use on a computer be in different formats. You may not have known they're in different formats, but you notice there are different things about them. It might be that you have, if you have a picture of a rhinoceros, it might be called rhino.jpg. It might be called rhino.img. So what's the difference? Well, these are both intended to do the same thing. They're intended to represent the data necessary to make a picture of a rhino come out on the screen. And yes, that's as good as you're gonna get with a rhino for me, okay? Why would there be two different types here? The data itself, which is made up of a bunch of ones and zeros, is actually organized in a different manner for each of these. Now, the exact way it's organized, really not that important. There's very little few times you're gonna have to get down into what are the different exact ways that they take these little teeny ones and zeros and arrange them and like how do they make it so that when they organize the data in the file, one piece of data goes here, another one goes here, another one goes here. You don't care. What's valuable to know is there are different methods for how you organize the data that a piece of software can then turn into this visual image. And this applies to a lot of different things besides just files that represent images. It can be documents, it can be videos, all that sort of thing. Why? Why are there so many different ones? The reason for having different data formats, particularly with images, but just in general as well, lays entirely in what's gonna be done with that data. The organization of the data needs to be optimized for what you will do with it. The reason to have different formats for different image files would have to do with what are you gonna do with those image files? If you're gonna do a tremendous amount of editing to them, you're gonna to wanna to have data that can be easily reformatted and changed a lot. If all you're gonna do is simply reduce the size of a document, for, of an image, for, and that's all you're really gonna to do to it, then you don't need to provide as much functionality or ease of functionality for modifying a bunch of different characteristics of the image itself. Now, that's a very simplified explanation of why different formats for different image files, different types of images, but it applies in so many different ways. There's probably 50 or 100 different formats for videos. Why? Well, here's an example. Apple has a piece of software designed to show videos called QuickTime. It's been around for a very, very long time. 
it required for the longest time that videos that were going to be shown in that software program be of the exact format intended for that software program and it was unable to handle any other formats and it did that for business reasons it might be right it might be wrong it's just the fact that it would only work on videos formatted the exact way that that program needed them to be so if something was made for windows media player which was a competitor in QuickTime, these two things wouldn't play nice. These guys said videos that we're going to play have to be formatted in the exact way. Dot WMV, I think, w Windows Movie, and dot QT, I think that was what the, the, the format was described as. But the point is, the data in those videos was arranged a certain way, optimized for that piece of software. There's a lot of other reasons why different formats, but they almost always relate to the piece of software that's going to process that file and what actions that software needs to do with that file. And so you'll optimize the way the data is organized for that purpose and that piece of software, and you'll give it a name to that format. And any other file, any other file that wants to be able to use, be used by that software has to conform to that exact format of a file. A final note as we reach the end of the course. Technology changes rapidly. As you go through your career, it's inevitable that the pieces of technology that you know, the languages you know well, the operating systems you know well, will change, sometimes to a minor degree, sometimes to a very great and drastic degree. In order to be able to navigate your career really well, it's important that you get the fundamentals down. This course has been part of that. And a couple of other points throughout your boot camp, you're gonna hit points where we stress very strongly some computer science fundamentals. And the reason for it is precisely because this technology is, is, is in its infancy. The computer industry is actually quite new in terms of industry overall. And it moves at a very rapid pace. And to be assured of having a really good career in this industry, you're going to have to stay apprised all the time of every new update that comes along in your area of expertise. And also face the fact that you'll never know everything at all. It's just not going to happen. And the things that you do need to learn, the ease with which you learn them and be able to apply them is based in great part on the degree to which you know your fundamentals really well. So make sure that as you're going through wrapping up this course and the rest of your courses here at the boot camp, that you get the fundamentals down. What are the fundamentals of all programming languages, of all web application, of all user experience? What are the things, when you distill it down, what's happening under the hood, what are the fundamental actions? And if you know those really, really well, then you'll be able to navigate what is gonna be an incredibly changed landscape, inevitably, and you'll do a good job of it.